There's good news. And the good news is that Jesus arose from the dead. And he is alive and he is risen. That is the good news. The word gospel found in the four gospels. The gospel according to, the gospel means good news. And the good news is that Jesus is alive. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a few moments, if you would, please. What a great time to take an opportunity and just go around and, and uh, hug a few folks or shake some hands or <laughs> however you feel comfortable, waving, whatever you feel comfortable with. But let's tell some folks we're glad to see them today on Easter Sunday. Go do that right now. Thank you. <laughs> you're here for the very first time today, welcome. We just want to welcome you and hope that, that you feel that welcome and that you feel a part of this worship service. If you're here for the very first time, we would like for you to take an opportunity to, to uh, look at a card that's right there in front of you. Hopefully it's in front of you in the back part of that pew and you'll find a guest card if you would please take it out and fill it out for us. Drop it in the offering plate when it comes by in a few minutes. We would just we would really appreciate to have a record of your visit and get to know you and meet you just as, as soon as we can. And we are, again, thankful for you being here today. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And on this Easter Sunday around the world, there is a lot of sadness. But there can be joy in the house of the Lord because Jesus is alive. Amen. He's alive for you. He's alive for me. He's alive for all of us who call on his name. Thank you for being here this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day that we've already had today. Thank you for a great time that we had at our sunrise service and a wonderful breakfast. Thank you for allowing us to do that. Thank you for all that you're going to do for us today in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. I have a few announcements for our youth. Uh, we have our summer camp coming up, Camp Fuego. It will be in June. Uh, don't forget to sign up. You have a couple more weeks to sign up. Uh, if you're planning to go on the mission trip, the uh, uh, deposit is due by next Sunday. And you need to be here next Saturday for the work day uh, so that you can show how much you're willing to go to the mission trip. So please be here and be ready to work. Thank you. Good morning, church. Just a couple of things to make you aware of what's going on the, this week on Saturday, the 23rd. Uh, we will have the Pine Car Derby. The RAs will have the Pine Car Derby here in the Richardson Building at 9 a.m. So if you have a boy who is in RAs, uh, be here at nine o'clock. If they do not have their car yet, you can either see me and I will get you over to Mr. Larry and we'll get them hooked up with a car, but that's this Saturday at nine. 
also this Saturday uh, in the Richardson building at 4.30, or is it 5 o'clock? 4.30? 5.30. I can't remember the time I put down. 5.30 this Saturday. We're going to have a family night. Uh, it'll be the Mario Kart edition. You say, what's that? Well, it's a Mario Kart tournament, uh, and it's going to be for uh, kids all the way through the adults. So it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a whole lot of fun to watch the kids beat the adults, so please come uh, and, and participate in that. We'll have food for you also, and that'll be at 5.30 this Saturday. So 9 o'clock, RAs, 5.30, everybody. Oh, also, I almost forgot. <laughs> Easter egg hunt is today. Uh, the plan was to do it out back um, in the, the grassy area like we normally do it, uh, but because of the rain earlier, we were going to move it to the old sanctuary. Well, it hasn't rained now for a little while, so we're going back to the field. I will be back up here at the closing of the service to let you know exactly where it is at, uh, but it will be <laughs> after service. I'll be, uh, I will not be dressed like this. I'll probably be sweating, uh, but we'll, uh, we will have one. This morning after service, it'll either be in the old sanctuary or the field. Just listen for the rain and you'll know which one it is. Go back. But he'll let you know. You'll find out at the end of service today. Good to see Jim Holland up here making announcements for our youth. He is, uh, works out here with our youth department. And uh, uh, since we're without a youth minister at this time, he'll be doing that every Sunday. And we appreciate Jim coming and be a, letting that be a part of uh, his ministry out there in the youth and uh, letting us know what's going on out there. Uh, all right, we are in a midst. Uh, many of you who are here uh, on Easter Sunday don't know what's been going on the last several weeks. We've been having a uh, uh, 300. Now, that's not that movie that came out a couple of years ago. This is 300. We're hoping to encourage our folks to be here in Sunday school. So we'd love to have you. If you're not a part of our Sunday school, come and be a part of us. We want to have 300 every Sunday in Sunday school. We want to have an average attendance of 300 in Sunday school. That's not a one-time high attendance goal, but an every Sunday goal that we should have for being in Sunday school. This is God's house. This is where we get to, to know more about each other and build family relationships through the Sunday school. And we do a lot of things together in our Sunday school, so we encourage you to continue to do that. With that in mind, uh, we've been encouraging people to uh, be active in their classes and uh, there's uh, one class that made that reached a goal of uh, their average attendance plus five, and that was Joel Kirby's class. He had, um, he had 20 in there. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> then there were other classes that uh, they're reaching their 100% attendance of their enrollment, and uh, these several of those are bed babies, the uh, four-year-old class, the kindergarten class, first grade class, High school girls class were all made 100% uh, today in their Sunday school, and we applaud them, appreciate them to, uh, for getting out there and getting the folks here every Sunday. Now, today was a special day in our church. We had, first time ever, a um, sunrise service out back, and that was at 7 o'clock, and uh, we had 188 people signed up for it. We had, at our sunrise service, 174. Fantastic. Fantastic. Praise God. Praise God. And then of those 174, we had 168 stay for breakfast, and you couldn't beat the breakfast. We appreciate all those guys that came up here. I think some of them were up here at 4.30 this morning cooking that breakfast. And let's give those guys a round of applause. And just can't say enough about our Sunday school. We had 264 for Sunday school this morning. Praise the Lord for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> Other announcements this morning. We will have a work day this coming Saturday. Uh, we've got several projects going on. We encourage you to be here at 8 o'clock. We'll work just till noon uh, on that day, so we encourage you to come and help us out. We've got several projects there. Uh, also, tonight, no services tonight because of a full day this morning, and uh, we need you to be with your families and spend time with them. We know there's a lot of families in today, so no activities tonight. And uh, these beautiful flowers here were given because he lives, and we thank those donors that gave those to us today, and uh, just praise the Lord for what he's done uh, through Jesus Christ, who was risen from the grave today. Brother Martin. A couple of very quick announcements. This coming Thursday night, the Singing Men of East Texas will be in concert with First Baptist Church of Nacogdoches. 
Uh, that'll be a 7 o'clock concert. If you get a chance to come down to Nacogdoches, we'd love to see you for that. Also, tickets are on sale now for our senior adult banquet. We do this every year in May. This will be the second, second week of May, um, or second Tuesday of May. Uh, tickets are $5 a piece, great food, good entertainment. The Kilgore Quartet's going to be here again. We'll do our thing and have a lot of fun with that. But we encourage you to uh, be a part of that, those of you 50 and above. Uh, you don't have to be a Joymaker member. This is for all the, all the 50 and above folks. I know it says senior adults, but y'all aren't. Well, some of you are. Um, but anyway, 50 and above, we'd like to have you come be with us. You can see the church office or Mr. Lee Reed uh, to get your tickets for that. We thank our choir for the music that they've done already this morning. They will be singing again of just a few minutes, uh, another great piece. We've sung the words. You've heard them before, and now it's time for you to sing it. The angel said, Why you seek you the living among the dead? For he has risen. Up from the grave he arose. It's hymn number 273. Let's sing together.
we have our offering guys will come and take our offering all right thank you thank you Mr. Bean I think you're going to pray for us this morning thank you for coming and being here what a great opportunity it is for us to share uh, a portion of what God has given to us to, ex to further the kingdom's work the greatest thing that Southern Baptist had a vision for back in 1845 was what came to be known as the cooperative program. It gives us an opportunity to, to extend this gospel, this good news around the world. A little bit right after the sunrise service, I was watching some of the news and a reporter was standing in front of a church in Ukraine. There was standing room only inside the church. They were standing outside to get into the church. There were refugees that had come to this small area because it was safe for the meantime there was a family that came because their town had been completely bombed and one of the girls in that family told the reporter she was excited to be there because this was the first time she had ever been in church the cooperative program sends the gospel of what you're here about today even to those small places in Ukraine and around the world. It's our way of being a part of what Christ wants to do for this world. Thank you for your support of this church. Thank you for your financial giving to support this church, but also to support the work around this world for Jesus Christ. Thank you for being faithful in that. Mr. Bean, come pray for us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the freedom we enjoy to be here. And I thank you for all the uh, opportunities we have to give back to you what you so generously give to us. And I ask you to be with your tithes and offerings that are presented today, and you would bless them and multiply them and glorify your name through them. We thank the, ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Thank you.
From a stable, a lovely light glows within. Is that a baby crying? There's excitement in the wind. Something's happening in bed. In Pilate's hall, from the porch, Pilate pleads with the angry mob. In this man called Jesus, I can find no fault. Something's happening in Pilate's hall. Joseph's grave when a Jesus of Nazareth has lain three days very early in the morning how the earth begins to quake something's happening at Joseph's people said? Wow. Thank you, choir. Great. There was any place that I could take you to Israel, there would be a lot of places that I would take you. 
I would take you to the Eastern Gate. It's just across from the Mount of Olives. And as you stand on the Mount of Olives, you could actually follow the path that Jesus took on Palm Sunday. It's called the Palm Sunday Route. As you walk down the, the hillside and come across the Kidron Valley, you can come up, you can't come all the way up to the Eastern Gate, but you can see the Eastern Gate. I'd like for, I wish everybody could see that Eastern Gate one time. I'd like to take you to the Sea of Galilee. There's nothing like being on a boat ride in the Sea of Galilee when the sun comes up. And you, write, you think about the story of Peter walking on water. There'd be a lot of places I'd love to take you, but one place that I would not want you to miss is what you see on the screen. It's known as Garden's Tomb. It is, it is outside the city walls of Jerusalem. It is taken care of by a British foundation. But it is just a few yards, maybe a hundred yards from Calvary. Standing where you would be standing if you took this picture, Calvary would be to the right maybe about 100 yards. You can walk up and, and actually look across and see Calvary, Golgotha. It's called in the New Testament the place of the skull, and it does look like a skull. You can see uh, the eyes. You can see the bridge of the nose. Time, erosion, wind, and rain has worn some of that off, but you can still see the skull, Calvary, Golgotha, as we read in Scripture. It is where Jesus was taken to be crucified. The Bible says that they took his body down and they took it to a tomb in a garden, a borrowed tomb. This tomb is in a garden this tomb is near Calvary. This tomb has been dated back to the first century. Is this the actual tomb of Jesus Christ? Most likely not. But it's not, the, it's not that it is or it is not that it's import, that is important. It is that this is an empty tomb. You can go in and, and sit for a while there's usually a large crowd always at the garden tomb, and rightly so. You can go in, there's a small place hewn out of rock where you can sit for a few moments. As you leave and come to that door, you must stoop over to walk out of it, but over that door are the words, He is not here, He is risen. If I could take you anywhere, I would take you there. If you had to miss a lot of places in Israel, you could miss a lot of places, but this is one place that you would not want to miss. The first time I saw it, it was overwhelming. The second time I saw it was overwhelming. The third time and the fourth time, it remains the most awesome place in all of Israel. In many places in Israel, there is... There are a lot of, of activity. Uh, it's crowded streets. It's honking of horns. It's, it's craziness sometimes in Jerusalem. You must get out of Jerusalem to find any kind of peace. But when you walk into this protected area, there is a place of just peace and comfort. Because the tomb is empty. If you were a Muslim today, you could travel to Mecca and you could see the tomb of Muhammad. But the thing about the tomb at Mecca, for the Muslims, Muhammad is still in it. 
You can go to many famous tombs and grave sites around the world. You can travel not far from this tomb and you, you can go to the tomb of Abraham and see the tomb of Abraham. You, here in America, you can go to uh, the National Cemetery in Arlington and you can see the, the, the graveside of John Kennedy and many other famous, famous people, but they're still in the tomb. They're still in the grave. You see, this empty tomb changed everything. There are some famous people in graves, perhaps even in tombs, but they're still there. This tomb is empty. This tomb changes everything. This tomb changed the world. This tomb has changed Thousands and thousands of lives who have not even been there to see it, but they believe it because they believe in Jesus Christ. Has the empty tomb changed your life? I hope it has. If it has not changed your life yet, I hope today with this great music and this wonderful fellowship that the empty tomb of Jesus Christ could change your life. Paul talked about this empty tomb and this thing called the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul was carrying on a debate within himself. He was putting it down in writing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse, beginning in verse 12. Let's read these verses and let me put a point to it, if you would. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, Now, if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, Paul is bringing about this debate. He's, he's asking these questions, and he's going to answer those questions. He said, if Christ is preached that he is alive, then how do some of you not believe that Jesus has truly risen from the dead? Back over in the writings of Peter, he said there's always scoffers that will not believe. And there are scoffers among us today out in this world. There are those who do not believe. There are those that if, if they could walk to that tomb and see that tomb, it may not change their life because they would not believe. Paul's writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 15, we read on in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now listen, what he's doing here is he's tying in the resurrection of the dead with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friend, that's important for you and me. Let's read on, verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. This empty tomb changed everything. Paul said, what if? What if that tomb is a nothing but a lie? What if this story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is nothing but a lie? Number one, preaching is useless. All preaching is useless if Jesus Christ did not come from that tomb. You see, the empty tomb validates the preaching of the gospel. 
that empty tomb validates, assures us of the preaching of the gospel. And if it did not, if Jesus Christ did not come from, the, from that tomb and from that grave, and he, like so many other religious leaders, are still dead in their tomb, then listen, our preaching is, is, is in vain. Faith is useless. Hope is useless if Christ did not come from that tomb. Our preaching is useless. Our faith is useless, Paul has said, and our hope is useless. If that tomb of Jesus Christ, wherever it is, still has his bones, then what we do here today means absolutely nothing. What we did this morning with the sunrise service means absolutely nothing. What we do in that baptistry and what we do when people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior means absolutely nothing if that tomb is not empty. If that tomb is not empty and if Jesus Christ did not resurrect from the dead, then what we do here is useless. I've wasted a life of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ if he didn't resurrect from that tomb. Maybe not from that one, but that one somewhere just outside of the city walls of Jerusalem, close to Calvary, there is an empty tomb somewhere that Christ walked out of. And if he did not, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith, my faith is in vain. Your hope, my hope is useless. The empty tomb validates the preaching of the gospel. The empty tomb also validates the promises of God. Let's look on, look at verse 20. But now, I like the way Paul changed everything. You see, the empty tomb changes everything. But now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What is that telling us? That Christ is that first one that has been resurrected from the dead, but there'll be many more. He was the first fruit. He was the first of many that will be resurrected from the dead if they believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You see, the empty tomb not only validates the preaching of the gospel, the empty tomb validates the promises of God. We read on, for since man came... For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. The empty tomb validates the promises of God. Listen, the Bible tells us, uh, someone has said, I've not counted every one of them, but it's a great example. Someone has said there are 7,000 promises in God's Word for you and I. 7,000 promises. That empty tomb validates every promise of God. If the empty tomb is not empty this morning, and Jesus is still dead somewhere in another tomb, somewhere in a grave somewhere, Every promise of God is a lie. That tomb validates the promises of God. What God has said is true. If there are 7,000 promises of God in the Bible for you and for me, he's never broken one of them and he never will break one of them. And every one of them is true. That Christ rose from the dead. And he rose from the dead for you. And for me. Now listen, there is a great promise that I'm looking forward to. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I'm looking forward to a resurrection of those who have followed Jesus Christ. You want to see what that's going to be like? Turn with me to First Thessalonians chapter four. This is the way Jesus, this is the way Paul the Apostle explains it to us about the coming of the Lord, the coming of Jesus Christ. How close is he? I don't know. I wouldn't dare tell you a date. I wouldn't dare tell you a time. I think I will tell you based on this word that Jesus Christ is coming again. And I think by everything we see around in the world happening to us today and around us, 
I think it's soon. Now look, here's what Paul, the apostle, wrote about this second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep in the second coming of Christ. There were some in Thessalonica that were asking, what about my, my family member that has died? Will they miss this second coming? He says, no, I want you to be aware of this. Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, now here it is, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. They're not going to miss it. You may not be here for what's about to happen and what we're about to read about. You may pass away before this happens, but listen, you're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. Here it is, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and here's what's going to happen. Number one, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. If you've ever lost a family member, a loved one, a friend, whoever it might be, and they knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and you know Jesus as your personal Savior, listen, this is just a time of separation. The time's going to come when you'll be reunited with them forever, and that's my hope. That's my hope. Because I have some folks I want to see again just real soon. Amen? And I bet you do too. And the Bible says that when he comes, the dead in Christ were going to rise first. Now look, verse 17. What happens if you're still here? It could happen this afternoon. Not a thing in the world to keep it from happening this afternoon. We who are alive and remain, he says, will be caught up together. That word caught up means raptured. You won't find the word rapture in the Bible, but you'll find the meaning caught up. John was caught up as he was writing the book of the Revelation. He says, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We shall always be with the Lord. We'll be caught up. That is that, that, is that resurrection of the dead that is promised by God because the tomb is empty. And Paul said, If that tomb was not empty the tomb of Jesus Christ is not empty, then we have no hope of the resurrection of the dead. We have no hope of seeing our loved one ever again. All those promises are wrong. But Paul said here, back over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in verse 20, he said, but now Christ is risen. That empty tomb validates the preaching of the gospel. That empty tomb validates the promises of God. There will be two bodily resurrections that we're told about in Scripture. The first resurrection is the one I just read to you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Those who are resurrected will be joined with Jesus Christ. And we'll enter a time of a thousand year reign with Jesus Christ of peace. It's called the first resurrection. The book of Revelation says, Blessed are those who are a part of that resurrection. The second bodily resurrection is talked about at the great white throne judgment. When those who did not know Jesus Christ, who did not follow Jesus Christ, who did not accept him as Savior and Lord, they too will be resurrected, but they will be resurrected and brought to the great white throne judgment where those without Christ will be judged forever and they will find their way into a burning lake of fire. Hell is real. It's not a myth. The devil is not a cartoon character with a fork tail and a pitchfork. He is out to devour you. He is out to devour me. He is out to devour the believers. The empty tomb validates the promises of God. The empty tomb validates our presence in glory. Look with me at verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God 
God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authorities and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Three things happen here. Christ delivers the kingdom to God. The destruction of the devil takes place. Verse 25, all enemies will fall subject to Jesus Christ. Paul himself writes in the book of Philippians, there is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And the empty tomb validates the preaching of the gospel. It validates the promises of God and it validates our presence in glory. And our last enemy that we will ever face and that we will overcome is called death. We will all face it unless Jesus Christ comes first. But death for the born-again Christian, the person that knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, listen, death is not death. Death is but a release from this world to a world that never ends. Where there is no pain, there is no crying, there is no sorrow. There is nothing but joy and happiness. If you think we celebrated Easter on this earth today, how do you think they celebrated Easter in heaven today? Look at the book of Revelation chapter 4. They cry out, worthy is the Lamb. I can envision hearing that from heaven today. Worthy is the Lamb as Jesus walks down the main street of heaven. Worthy is the Lamb. Do you know this Lamb? Do you know this Jesus? Oh yeah, I know him. I'm here. It's Easter. I'm here. But do you have him in your heart? You see, there's a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. And they're totally two different things. A lot of people in the world have a head knowledge about Jesus, but it's not in the heart. Let me tell you, even Satan can quote scripture. And he knows. He has a head knowledge about Jesus, but Satan does not have a heart knowledge about Jesus. You have that opportunity today. I know it's hard, difficult any time to get up and walk down an aisle of a church, especially on a big day when the church is filled and, and there are a lot of people there. But don't let that intimidate you today. If Jesus Christ wants you to make a decision today about salvation, about church membership, about bab baptism, about rededication, whatever it might be, this altar is open for you. You can come. You'll not find condemnation. You'll not find judgment. You'll find love. You'll find love. Remember the parable. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. His father didn't condemn him. His father didn't judge him. His father ran to meet him. And when you come to Jesus, the father runs to meet us. Maybe you'd come today during this invitation. We're going to stand today. Brother Mark has a hymn of invitation for us with the choir. It'll be on the screen there and we can follow along. But maybe you have a decision you would like to make today. Whatever it may be, however God has spoken to you. We want you to have that opportunity to do that today. Let's bow our heads together. Father, I pray right now you bind Satan from this place. He would love to talk us out of making any kind of decision. He would love to, for us to put it off. He would love for us to put it out of our mind for a while. But maybe we know in our heart we need to make a decision today for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you set us free from the bondage of Satan and from his influence. And may we respond to that empty tomb that changed the world. May that empty tomb change us today. In Jesus' name, amen.